Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Advantage podcast. My name is Lauren Cooper. I am just north of Toronto in Canada and I'm joined by another Canadian, a fellow Canadian friend, rock star, real estate agent, Michael Samra. Mike, say hey to everybody out there. How's it going guys? Thanks for having me, Lauren. Yeah, my pleasure. You've got a lot to offer in the way of knowledge, experience, content. Uh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about kind of where you work and your start in the business? Wow. Okay. So yeah, I work uh, primarily in the GTA, Toronto, West End mostly. Uh, it's primarily uh, what I do from the lake all the way up. Um, my niche, my forte is cold calling. I started off cold calling. I started off uh, cold calling out of necessity. So um, when I got into the business, I was a plumber by trade prior to this. Um, my wife, uh, we just had our first kid. She was on mat leave and I basically quit my plumbing job and decided I want to get into real estate, which was great timing. Obviously not. <laughs> when was this? Oh, 13 years. My, so yeah, 13 years ago. Okay. So 13 years ago, your wife is pregnant with your first kid. Yep. You're making decent money as a plumber. I assume plumbing is, you know, it's decent. It was, yeah, I was doing, I was doing a, a commercial plumber, industrial plumber. So I was doing some good stuff, but yeah, it was long hours, really hard. So. Okay. And, and, uh, and you have to, you know, be committed to the crack when you're in plumbing. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but all kidding aside, I mean, you went from plumbing into real estate. You just jumped straight in full time right off the bat. I did. I basically quit my job. I quit my job, uh, and basically decided I wanted to get into real estate, start doing the courses. Yeah. So it was, it was tough times. I was literally like, I remember the point I was doing, uh, young Dundas square where they have, uh, I think city TVs, there are CTVs there. So I was doing that building. That's what I was doing. I did that from the ground up. And I remember I was on a, on a lift hanging some pipe. I remember thinking to myself, I was by myself. It was like three in the afternoon. And I was like, I can't do this for the rest of my life. This is, I got more to offer somehow, some way, whatever it is. I just not, I, I love plumbing, but it's just, I had more, I had more potential than this. Right. So sure. Uh, yeah, it was basically it. I was like, I'm, I'm done. Um, took the courses, uh, you know, I, I, and it was, it was a, it was a rough go until I got my license. And then, you know, as you get your license, then it's just like home run. It was amazing. No, it's not. It was still... <laughs> it was hey, still... for some people, it seems like they fall with their ass in a pan of cream, you know, like it wasn't that way for me as most people listening know. And, and I guess it wasn't for you. So tell us a little more about that. Uh, so, yeah. So basically um, struggling through it. My wife was on mat leave, had her first born. Then she had to go back to work. Uh, so I kind of was starting to do finish up my courses started to get into real estate and thought, okay, this is great. What, am, what the hell am I going to do? So I literally was starting off going through Kijiji. I was, I started off cause I, I don't have a big network. I don't have a big sphere. I don't have uh, any of those, those things to fall back on. So I basically had to just basically uh, go through Kijiji and I would email every night, email every single FISBO for sale by owner, anything like that. I would just email them. I literally emailed so much every night that Kijiji would kick me out because I reached the maximum amount of emails I was allowed to send. Wow. Um, and then through that, started to get into understanding what prospecting is, starting to cold call. I would cold call these FISBOs and uh, all, the, all those type of people on that. And then really started to hone my craft, started to find people in the industry that, you know, were obviously um, already in it, had experience and kind of learned from them. So <clears throat> what what got you the traction? Were you getting any traction from all those emails? Yeah, it's hard to say. No, probably not. I was probably just spitting my tires, just trying to do as much as I can. Right. I did get listings from it. Yeah, I mean, it was it's an evolution. I mean, you know as well as anybody, it's a, real estate's an evolution as far as your craft, right? So you get better at things, you start to move up. So um, I needed to go through the emails and fall flat on my face and call people and sound like an idiot to get a little bit better at it to start putting together maybe a little bit more of an attractive email to start getting some responses. And I did get, I did get listings from it. It, it did end up working. Um, so yeah, it was, I had no other option. Is that call, door knock, do all that other stuff because I had nobody, nothing else to do and we needed the paycheck, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. So from that point on, you know, you're starting to get a little traction, but you're thinking maybe this isn't the best use of my time. I mean, how, what was the progression from, from all those emails and getting kicked off of Kijiji slash Craigslist to everything else. Yeah, so then it's okay. So my mentor from my office that I started with, um, he's a huge door knocker. So he would always, for whatever reason, he gravitated to me. I don't know why he could be the biggest asshole in the world to a lot of people, but uh, for whatever reason, he seemed to like me. Um, so I would start to then figure out that he would door knock. So I said, okay, let me try door knocking. And I, I figured, okay, let, let's go through this. I'm an impatient person. So for me, 
I took an hour to hit like 10, 15 doors. And I'm like, oh my God, this is going to take forever. There's got to be a faster, more efficient way. So mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to start the call. So that's how I kind of got into calling because uh, I didn't want a door knock and I wanted to. Uh, and at that point in time, my wife was still working. So I had to squeeze real estate in between uh, like daycare times at that point. So from nine, nine o'clock in the morning till three, four o'clock, I had to do what I could do during that time. So how can I maximize it? Well, I know I can make X amount of phone calls in an hour. So that's basically what I ended up doing. And, and I started to get traction through that as I started to call and call, started to you know, develop some type of relationships with people and uh, it started to evolve from there. All right, let's talk about that. So number one, you thought efficiency, it makes sense to, it's quicker to dial than to walk and yeah. walk and knock. So that's fine, I get that. Were you using the same kind of script and approach um, for both or was it a little bit different? You know what? Um, it's evolved over time. I've definitely, you know, definitely analyzed it a lot more. It was along the same lines, um, but for the most part, yeah, it was, it was it was the same gist of it as far as what I was saying. I've gotten a lot cleaner with it, a lot more straight to the point, a lot more advanced as far as what I'm doing. I think what's changed is I think with any good prospector, with any good salesperson, I'm asking the right questions. Um, so that's what's changed before I'd be, you know, someone says they want to sell, I'd be great. Thanks. So I hang up the phone and get, get ready to do it. But, <laughs> you know, and then, then you go there and you find out, well, yeah, he wants to sell maybe in 10 years, not now. So now, and, and, you know, I, 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 I'm helping people with that as well, as far as what to say and what, to, what, what questions to ask. It's hugely important about qualifying it. So I think I've gotten better over time at qualifying the people on the phone. Okay. And did you start away using systems right off the bat or were you just hand dialing? So yeah, it was just hand dialing. First of all, it was just hand dialing. I had, um, in Canada, we have a telelisting, which is like a glorified yellow pages. So I was, I've always been kind of using that. Before I was paying for that, I was literally going through yellow pages, uh, doing a reverse address search, searching by streets, stuff along those lines. So yeah, dialing by hand, going through that, you know, I started off dialing by hand and then decided, okay, well, how can I add a system to this to make this a little bit more efficient? Uh, and then after that, how can I add, you know, the CRM system, make this a little bit more efficient and how can I, so you start adding and putting systems together and you start to fine tune it and tweak it. And I ended up finding, you know, my systems I use now and what works for me kind of. So, so what does work for you? <laughs> so, okay, fair enough. <laughs> I didn't know you want to get to specifics, but we're sure. getting into specifics, my friend, okay. we want to help people. Perfect. So I use a Mojo dialer. So I've used, so Mojo dialer is an automatic dialer. I upload numbers into this system and it calls numbers for me. It actually calls three people at the same time. And then I, I, I get to listen. So basically I sit there with my headset in and I just let the phone ring. And it, when someone live comes on the phone, I hear a little beep, beep. And I say hello and I go through my script. So the dialer is what helps me get through 100, 150 numbers an hour, 200 numbers an hour, depending on how long I speak to people. So that's the system that I used to call. And then once I retrieve the information, and, and I always use this term as you know, adding to my database, I end up using a CRM, a contact management system, relation management system, whatever you want to call it. And I use agent locator for that. And I basically put all those people that get their emails and I put them into that CRM. And the specifics for why I do that, and I talk to people a lot about this, is that what can I give them? I have a dog, uh, you know, if you follow my Instagram, you'll see I have a dog. I train it. And one of the things the trainer said is, you know, when you want the dog to do something really, really important, you need a high value treat. So I'm like, okay, I can use the same concept with prospects. So if I want to get a prospect's email, can I give them a high value treat to obtain their email or to get, you know, that contact information? And yeah, I definitely can. What's something that's in, somebody's interested in? Well, they're not definitely interested in a banana bread recipe or a cocktail or a poem, like you know, in a lot of these real estate newsletters. What they're interested in is what their neighbor is selling for, or what they sold for, or what something sold in their neighborhood. So you know, in in, in Toronto here, we're allowed to sell, to give them sold data. So I get their information because they want to know what their, their neighbors are selling for. When something goes for sale, they're, they, they can see that. And I have people in my database um, from, you know, two years ago that are selling with me because they've been constantly being nurtured by these emails, seeing stuff along those lines. So that's great. And, you know, I, I deal with the agent locator as well and, and no auto and all those guys. So the. I'm 100% all about what, what they have to offer. Let's dig a little deeper into the Mojo system because I know they offer a single line dialer and a triple line dialer. Okay, now we're getting into the specifics of, of efficiency of cold calling. Sure. Um, 
I found when I tried the triple line dialer that it's the same, the same holds true with a single line dialer. There's a bit of a pause, right? There's that pause that the person kind of like, yes. hello, hello. And then there's nothing going on on our end until we hear, you know, we're triggered. And I found that that was even exaggerated on the triple line dialer. Maybe that was just my imagination. How do you find that? So I don't know if you've did it, but they can, you can put it on where there's a beep that goes on. Okay. So I don't know if you've done that, but so basically when someone live goes on beep, I hear a beep and then I'll go, hello. And then I, I sometimes have to say it a couple of times, but yes, it does happen. There is some latency issues with that. And I've called them numerous of times. It has to do with your voice over IP phone that you use. Are you using a Bluetooth headset? All that stuff adds up to delays. The other thing that I found out, <clears throat> excuse me, is that if you, you might have to open a portal on your internet that you're using wherever you are. So if you open up this certain portal, Mojo will tell you what to do. You can call your service provider and make sure that that portal is open. Sometimes that helps out. Um, but regardless, I've gone through, because it's not a cheap system. It's probably one of the most expensive systems out there. So I've gone through and tried to save money on it, tried to look at all different dialers and stuff. And in my opinion, it's the most easiest and most reliable to use. All the other ones seem a little bit more clunky. So, okay, yeah. That's good to know. Now, in terms of how do you decide when someone's thinking about, I want to get into, you know, cold calling, not that anyone's really craving the idea of cold <laughs> calling, but, but, you know, we all need to get business from somewhere and that's a solid proven way of prospecting. So if someone is thinking about that, how do you decide who to call? So before we get cold calling, in my opinion, has helped me in my whole career. The reason being is that cold calling allows me to understand objections and how to handle an objection. I mean, that cold call, th those, that skill relates not only to that phone call, but that in-person, it relates to a negotiations table, it relates to you know when you're at a live listing presentation. So um, that's the most important thing as far as the cold call. And when people wanna get into cold calling, that's what they have to understand, that this skill is, can goes across so many platforms. It's not just for the cold call. Um, it has allowed me to talk specifically and move a conversation forward and heard the conversation to where I wanted to go. That's literally what cold calling has done for me. So, you know, someone who's thinking of wants to get better in sales, you should really understand how to handle objections. And the best way to handle objection is listen, go live on a phone call and live on your feet and let's see how you can make out because you're probably going to fall, which you probably will, but over time you'll get better at it. So, cold calling that concept of cold calling that's what pisses me off too because you see all these <laughs> you see how many ads do you see lauren about real estate never make a cold call again and all this other stuff that's and i right. tell people all the time you can get leads anywhere leads are easy to get leads it's not about getting leads it's about converting the leads right so it's like i use the hockey analogy i can give you the best skates in the world i can give you a stick i can provide ice pad for you i can give you all the equipment the top-notch equipment but if you can't skate, it is irrelevant. If I can give you a person here that wants to sell, but you can't close them, it is irrelevant to you. This lead means absolutely nothing. So people have, you know, are asked backward. Instead of working on their actual craft on how do I handle an objection? How do I overcome this? They just want leads. And they think they're just going to fall in their lap and someone's going to say, yeah, I want to sell my house. I don't care what you have to say. You're the best and I want to do it. And that's just not how it works, right? Yeah, it's a matter of developing communication skills because in sales, we are communicators and the better communicators that we are, the better we do in sales. That's what it comes down to bottom line, right? 100%. It's, it, it really, what it really comes down to is a, a, identifying somebody's problem and having the solution for it. And that comes with a question based system that comes with understanding that and, and a lot of people get thrown off because the general public will use smoke screens to prevent people from coming in. So they'll, you know, like they, I use the analogy of you go to a, you know, you go to American Eagle to buy jeans. You, the salesperson comes up to you. Can I help you? And the first thing you say is no. And literally five minutes later, you're going to them. Uh, yeah, you have this in a size, whatever, right? You, your first instinct, everyone's first instinct is the no. It's understanding to identify where their problem is or what their problem is. Then you can sell them the solution. Right. You can, a, you can craft it towards what, you know, solving their specific problem, but let's take a small step back. Cause I definitely want to dig really deep into this. Cause I know you're good at it and you love it and it's great, <laughs> okay. but I want to know when someone's thinking of calling, who the hell do they call? You know, like, so yeah, they can decide? call wherever. So I tell people all the time. I mean, 
you know, there's a couple of things you can do to figure out what area to call, but just call an area, find out you need to know, you need to be the expert in the area. So if you're going to call an area and not know what's sold on the street, not to know what's for sale in the area, you're doing yourself and whoever you're calling an injustice. So it doesn't matter what area you call, call an area you call. I call the area I grew up in. This is the area that I, I grew up in. My parents still live here. I don't live in this area. I don't live in this area and I don't sell in the area that I live in very rarely. It's for family and friends I sell in that area. So the area you would want to look into and first of all, see what the turnover rate is. So if you're looking at an area and there's only like five houses a year that go for sale, it might not be the best area to be prospecting in. Um, but I tell people all the time, pick an area. Most of the time, I mean, in the GTA, there's pretty well not no area that's not selling. So you're pretty well okay with that. Know who your competition is. Know who has the market share. And then reverse engineer it. If you've got, if you're looking to get 1% share of X amount of listings that come out a year, what does that mean for you? So if there's 300 listings that sell, 300 houses that sell in this area a year, and you want 1% share of that, that's three homes. Is that going to be enough for you to survive? Are you looking to obtain 10% share in that area? Does somebody have 80% share already? So understanding those numbers is huge. But that's what gets people confused and that's what gets people not to do it, unfortunately. That's why I hate to go into those details because they start to get caught up. And as realtors, we get caught up with planning and planning and understanding and trying to get things done and we never actually execute. Right. Probably one of our biggest, biggest faux pas in this business is that we, you know, not many people execute on their things. Yeah, well, the devil is in the details, though, so we don't want to skip over that. Like, let's go ahead and explain it to them. Let's talk about turnover rate. How do you figure out turnover rate in an area here where we are located? Um, if you were going to do like a geographic farming area and send out postcards, for example, uh, you'd find out the postal route, the, the streets that are included. You look at that in the MLS system and you'd say, all right, how many homes are there? Because the postal route gives you how many homes there are compared to how many homes that have sold over this this year, last year, the year before, do it over a couple of different years. And that'll tell you the turnover rate. So you can get areas that are 10% turnover rate, very rarely, um, or more likely you're looking, you know, five to 7% sort of turnover rate is, is sort of decent. Uh, what do you see as a good turnover rate? So again, I just, how many, if I want, I look at more of a sense on how many houses sell in this area over the year. Right. Right. So if there's, if, if I get a thousand homes sell in this area, can I, can I realistically say I want 10% share of this area or can I get six listings in this area for the year? Will that be good enough for me? So I guess the major thing that I look at and I would tell people to focus on, is there enough of the pie to get a piece of? Right. That's the what what thing. is realistic to think about though? So when, from coming from, from experience and knowing not just your numbers, but you have some insight into other people's numbers as well, because you're doing a little bit of kind of coaching in, in this group thing. Mm -hmm. Um, what is realistic to expect if you're going into an area that let's say there's maybe a, a fairly dominant player, but we're not talking 80%, they've got like 15%, 20% market share. Um, so there's still market to be had. Let's say there's, you know, whatever, uh, at least use easy numbers, a hundred homes. Okay. Yep. There's a hundred homes there. So what kind of market share is realistic to expect when you're first getting in there or building over time? It's it. What's realistic? It's, that's, a, that's a hard question. That's I know. a really hard question to say, right? <laughs> I'll refer back to the hockey analogy, right? Are, will you be able to skate after a year and play, be an amazing hockey player? I don't know. It depends on how much time and effort you put into it. Because you could call every single day for the rest of the year and still get goose egg, right? And if you haven't practiced, if you're not working your objections, if you're not role playing, if you're not doing the work behind it, and that's where it becomes a very scary loaded gun to give somebody when you say, well, if you just prospect, you'll get listings. Well, no, you got to be good at prospecting and you got to know what to say. So if everything else is involved in it, then yeah, you should, you should see definitely a, you know, you should see that scale rise up where you're actually getting traction, but it comes down to the individual, whether they're actually looking to improve their, their own skills in that aspect. And, and unfortunately, there's some people that don't, they'll try it for two, three months, they'll call, they'll get no traction and they won't understand. And I use the analogy all the time that you're gonna become really shitty on the phones. You're gonna have people hang up on you. You're not gonna do good. Then you're gonna get good on the phones. This is what happened for me. I got really, really good on the phones and I was able to book every friggin' appointment. I was booking appointments left, right and center. People couldn't say no to me, but I couldn't get the listings. Then, you know, for the evolution of not being to make a call, then to making a call good, getting an appointment, 
failing on the listing appointment to then becoming really, really good at the listing appointment, that's where the evolution comes into play. And it's a slow progression. But as you work on your skills, that's where that comes in. That's where that, that's where it's huge. So working on your skill set, and it's it's not hard, Lauren. Like, think about it. You already know what people are going to say. Like, how mind-blowing is that? When you pick up the phone and they say no, you are thrown back, but you should you already already anticipate they're gonna say no. Okay, what do I say next? Like you haven't planned this out. That's that, that's the and that's the ignorant part of people where I'm just gonna think on my feet. Well, you I can tell you right now all the different objections that you're gonna get, and I can tell you how to handle them. If you haven't figured that out for yourself, well, then you're not very prepared. Yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, it does come down to preparation. Um, all right, let's jump into the types of scenarios that you face on a regular basis when calling. All right. Okay. So what type of scenarios do you run into in terms of objections right off the bat? There's the 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 opening line, which like you said, you go into the jean store or yep. the gap or whatever, and you're like, hey, someone approaches you, can I help you? And automatic instinct is no, I'm fine, or no, I'm not selling, or carry me mm -hmm. out in a box, or all that stuff. Like, give me the stuff that So you want to get to the nitty-gritty of this? Let's, let's get into the like, nitty-gritty. Okay, I want people to learn something and, awesome. and get a sense of it. Okay. So my script is very, very simple. I've been trained by Mike Ferry, Brian Buffini, Derek Lipsky from Boston, Massachusetts. I had a lot of coaches. The reason I say I'll, I'll tell you why I say things. So when someone picks up the phone, if it's a man or a woman. I'd say, hello, is Mr. Cooper there, please? Right? I'm not asking for the homeowner because I'm not duck cleaning. Um, I'm going to ask for the person. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is subconsciously connect with you. Because if I say, Mr. Cooper, your ears go up. This guy must know me. First instinct, right? Okay, this guy knows my name. Hey, Mr. Cooper, it's Mike Sammer from uh, Mike Sammer, the realtor calling. How are you today? I'm good. Okay, he knows my name. And he's a realtor. He's asking how I am. I I'm doing good. Good. I was just calling to see if there's any interest in selling the property there on uh, Alderbury. Okay, he knows my name. He seems to be friendly. And he knows my address. He must be. A, he must be a competent realtor. Right off the bat, subconsciously, we're talking about the subconscious. And you're going to say probably no. So the next step in this is listening. What is the no? Is it a hard no? Is it a um, no? Or like so, you have to decipher that. And then I usually go into, oh, okay, not a problem. You know, have you given any thought to maybe making a move later this year or sometime next year? And that's the key aspect. You, it's the gene story of no, and I'm just going to push past that if I think I should. And I'm not always right, but for the most part, I think I am. And I'll ask them if they're looking to make a move sometime. Like, it's a gentle suggestion question. And then usually they open up. And I've had people tell me their life stories over the phone and... I've had 50 realtors call me and you're the only one I've talked, I've spoken to. I'm like, oh, okay, well, that, that's great. So the psychology behind that allows me to, you know, make that friendly phone call, but it's inquisitive questions towards them that allows them to open up because as realtors, we are very egocentric. We love Thanks. to see our pictures. We <laughs> love to see everything like that. That's how it is. So that doesn't work on the phone right? That doesn't work on the phone. People don't give a shit who you are or what you do. They want to talk about themselves. And if I can make them feel good talking about themselves or their homes or out, find out what their question is, I'm in. I've built a nurturing a relationship now. So that's the aspect of it. Then once I ask them, are you looking, then I, then I can judge it. Are you looking to make a move sometime this year or is it, you know, maybe next year or down the road? Well, that they, well, you get that. Well, we're boom. I'm in now. Now, I, now I, I'm, I'm getting what the problem is, what their issue is, and now I can sell the solution. They're looking later this year. They're looking in three years. They're looking, uh, you know, once the kids go back to school, then they're looking. That's when you start to get into that. And now I'm not selling, you know, Wolf of Wall Street, sell me this pen. Now I can sell a pen to someone who actually needs a pen, not selling a pen and blanket, car, you know, carpet bombing everybody to see who wants a pen. Right. Yeah, it's much more specific. Now, how do you decide when and how to go for the email, when or who to go for a, like an email or contact information. So, so who is worth staying in touch with? Anybody in your farm area. Anyone in your farm area. I mean, we have agent locator, put as many people as you want in the damn thing. Doesn't bother me, it won't hurt me. Uh, I will put people in my farm area if they're looking in five or 10 years to sell, not a problem. Can I, you know, would it be possible to get your email address? So this is again, a little script. Would it be okay if I got, would, would it be okay if I kept in contact with you by email? And what are they going to say? 
No, perfect. No problem. I'm going to go to my next thing. Oh, not a problem. Totally understand. The only reason I was asking is because, you know, I wanted to keep in contact with you, but also I'm able not only to send you when something sells and the pictures and the days on market, but I can also send you the sold price. So would it be okay if I got your email? And usually they'll say, wow, I just had a guy this morning, actually, I got a guy this morning and said, you're a good salesman. <laughs> I said, I'm, not, I'm just telling the truth. I, I can, yeah, actually, I'd like that. And I can send it to you. I know you don't want to be bombarded. If you want, I can only send it to you once a month. Actually, Michael, that'd be great. Perfect. Not a problem. So now I've got their email address. Email address goes into my agent locator. They're getting the sold data. Automatically, their email gets put into my constant contact and they get my monthly newsletter. So now I've got them two folds, keeping in contact with them. They're constantly seeing my information, my name on a monthly, bi-weekly, daily basis, whatever it happens to be. Now I'm top of mind. And now how they... often do you reach back other than the email that goes out automatically when, you know, what, if it's once a week, once a month, or as it happens, depending on how much the information they want when their neighbor sells and your monthly email. Is there any other way that you stay in contact with these people over time? Let's say they're, they're a, a long-term nurturer, three, five years, maybe. Um, do you call them every once in a while or do you just let that kind of flow? And then as it approaches, I do, I'll try to like, you know, every quarter I try to go through my CRM and go through all the people, um, any, any events like, um, Thanksgiving, pumpkins, Christmas, stuff like that, you know, Mother's Day or, or, or Valentine's Day, I'll do something for that. So what I'll do is I'll pull my system out. I'll find, I'll go through the whole list of people in my farm area and then I'll categorize them. And then I, if, you know, for pumpkins, I'll go drop off pumpkins. If I got to drop off uh, 500 pumpkins or 200 pumpkins of people, I end up just dropping it off on their doorstep. Um, the one that really worked well for me, which I literally got two listings from is on Thanksgiving. So I pulled up, pulled, exported my, my list of people in my farm area and I categorized them as A, B, and C, like listing, like people that are possibly looking to make a move. Based on what? Based on timing or what? Yeah, based on my notes in the system. This person's looking to make a move this year. They're, you know, I've been in contact with them. You know, so I, I get, again, it comes back to that question based when are they looking to make a move and why? So I've already, you know, I've already got that information. So on that, on that information, I then decide, you know what, I, and I dropped them off a of pumpkin pie. Okay. See, that's great. The, the thing that, that gets me is that I got stuck when trying to figure out how to grade people in my CRM early on, not knowing what really constitutes an A, B, C, D, or, or however you want to call it, hot, warm, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to know what it was that, that made you grade these people an A or a B or a C, and then who did you actually drop it off to? Because if you've got a database of 2,000 people overall, which is not you know, unlikely. I mean, over time yeah. you build up that database, yeah. it, it gets pretty costly to give that to everybody. So I can, what's the best way that, that you found that it works is, for you? Is, is keeping, keeping an eye, uh, you know, um, monitoring your CRM and going through those contacts and understanding when they, when they're looking to sell. So again, it comes back to qualifying that person properly. So every person in my CRM, I should know a time frame. I should have some idea of when they're looking to sell. Now, the hard part is, is that it's not always true. Right. So you have people that say, I'm not going to sell for five years, and then they end up selling a year in, in a year's time. So you have to use your judgment as well on this and trust your gut. There's some people that, you know, they're not looking to sell right now, but I dropped the pie off anyways, just to, just to make a feeler. And, you know, I've had uh, two people say, Mike, you got the listing because because of that pumpkin pie you dropped off, right? They weren't planning to sell. I just took, I, you know, I figured, you know what, what do I have to lose? I could, I, I spend money on so many other stupid stuff probably. And, <laughs> and, and all this other things like, so if I spent five bucks on a pumpkin pie and I spent an extra $300 on them, does it really matter? It, it's worth it. I send out flyers that get thrown in the garbage every month. So might as well go buy somebody's house, knock on their door, give them something they're actually going to, they will remember, right? Yeah. Well, just, just so you know, if you're going to drop off a pie for me, make sure that it's Apple. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds All good. Right. Cool. <laughs> All right. So um, you mentioned something else now. So you're talking about a really geographic farming and you're, you're approaching it by calling this farm, but you also mentioned you're sending out a postcard once a month, right? So, yeah. I mean, let's talk about all the ways that you really attack um, attack is maybe not the best word, but, well, that's fine. but but cover your geographic farm area so that you stay top of mind for those people. So number one, you're calling through the list. How many times do you think you go through people 
per year? Not not people that you've contacted, but just in general. Uh, it could be maybe three times. So my the system automatically recognizes when I uh, when I categorize somebody. So if somebody picks up the phone and they say hello, that means now I've got to categorize them as I did I contact them? Are they not contacted? Are they trash? Are they a future follow up? Is it so I have to categorize that person. So once that person gets pulled out of the main list, they get categorized. I'm no longer calling that person anymore. And are so you pre-setting that in Mojo or does it do it automatically? It does it automatically. So you have to put it as a contact or no contact. And if it's a contact, what category are they going in? So that's how it does. So my list keeps on getting dwindled down and I keep on calling that list till I end up reaching everybody. And I only will call those people. I think it, Mojo set, I have it set up in Mojo where, you know, every three, I can't call somebody more than within three days. So if I call them today, it won't allow me to call them back until Monday. But I have four or five different lists from little tiny areas in my farm that I call and I switch around. So I'm not necessarily calling those people over and over again. They're probably seeing my number possibly if they don't pick up, uh, then they'll still be in that system. And I'll just regurgitate and call them until I get until I can label them as a trash, as a contact somewhere, whatever it has to, happens to be. Right now, how many homes do you figure you're calling? Uh, overall in your geographic farm area? So I started off with like 3,000, then I bumped up to 5,000. Now I'm at 11,000. Wow. Yeah. So I uh, have started to drift a little bit further south from where I am and add that into my farm area. Um, and I call that area as well. So I have about 11,000 numbers that I'm calling, uh, homes that I call, and I flyer those homes. So geographical farming uh, has a lot to do with, you know, it's it's pillars and the more pillars that you add, the more stability you have. So calling is not the only thing, flyering is not the only thing, but when you add all those stuff together and then they see a for sale sign, then you're doing a community event, uh, then you're doing something else. That's when that adds that legitimacy to who you are. Yeah, it's the consistency. I think people need and want to see you consistently making that effort and being out there and not being a fly by night kind of person. So when you're, you're flyering them, whether it's once a month or however often, you're making those calls, like you said, you're, there, you're out in the community. Why don't we talk about, that's basically building a plan, a, a more cohesive plan than just randomly dialing numbers and never talking to these people again. Yeah. Um, this starts to make more sense to people that think, okay, cold calling sounds very randomized, but when you now center it towards you know, a specific geographic farming area or type of owner or building or whatever the mm -hmm. case may be you've got now um a flyer coming to them uh what else are you doing you mentioned community events what type of events so i do um what i've been doing with some of my flyers is doing giveaways with the flyers a lot of people you see a lot of instagram and stuff like that but i'll actually send out flyers and i did it for christmas for gingerbread cookies uh, gingerbread houses so what i did is i sent a flyer out to my farm area said, if you want a free gingerbread house, just log on to this site, register, and I will personally deliver a gingerbread house to you. So rather than having them show up to a particular area, because I know some people do it where they'll say, pumpkin giveaway at this school at this time or whatever the case may be, yep. right? Yep. So how come you chose to do it this way instead? Well, doesn't it make sense that when they register, I get their phone number, email address and address and all that stuff. I have all their information now. You like how I served that up to you? <laughs> they gave it right to me. Exactly. Right. You served it to me just as much as they're serving it. They're serving it themselves. Right. So yes, it's about me being able to get their information and be able to keep in contact with them. So it's, I'm happily will give it, but they have to give something back, which is their information. Otherwise then I might as well just be on the corner, giving away pumpkins to, and just hoping that somebody does it. And that's not what I'm in for. I'm not in the hopes of it. I'm all about metrics. Just like my phone calls. I know how many calls I need to make to make how many contacts to put how many people in my database. I know those numbers off my off by heart. So it's the same concept. If I'm going to send out flyers, I want people to register. Register for it, and I'll personally deliver it to you. And literally, for the, for, the, um, for the gingerbread house, I would sit in my office, and I, have, I would have them stacked up over here. And if I got somebody to come in, at 3 o'clock, I would go do deliveries. And literally, they would register at 1 o'clock, and I'd knock on their door holy geez, that was quick. I'm like, yep. I'm like, yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. No problem. My sticker's on it. Now they're getting an email from me. They got an email saying, oh, you're getting your gingerbread house right away. Merry, you know, happy holidays or whatever it happens to be. So it's all these little things. It's not about this big, huge one idea. It's these small little things that all add up. 
Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. And it's that consistent effort to do it. Now you mentioned knowing your metrics, knowing your numbers. Yes. It's important for people to understand this. Some people, when they're getting into, uh, you know, calling or dialing for dollars, <laughs> uh, they'll, they'll think about either time spent online or making the calls. They'll think about contacts depending on who you're talking to is a different version of what a contact is. They'll talk about who they're actually talking to or how many prospects they get. What is it that you measure that you track and measure to, to really hit your numbers? So I, and I teach people this. So I do that prospecting core, um, you know, accountability group and stuff like that. If I was able to tell a person that, listen, if you call for an hour, you'll make a hundred dials, you'll talk to 20 people and you'll add two people to your database for one hour. If that was true, then start to multiply that and start to do that over and over again. So that means like if you called three days a week, that means I had six people to my database a week. You know, that means I had 24 people a month. That Those numbers start to get become really, really big over time. So for me, I'm all about, you know, I used to be before like five years ago, it'd be about how many appointments I can set. Times have changed. It's not like setting appointments anymore. Now it's about nurturing that lead over time. That's really what it's about. So now, you know, the game's changed a bit. It's about, you know, not pushing for an appointment, but, you know, getting their information and being able to keep in contact with them. So if I can add every, and I call for two hours, uh, two hours a day, two to three days a week, that's what I do my cold calling. If I can add two people to my database during a call session, I'm happy. It's important that people hear this because they, they think they're going to hear somebody say, and it has happened to me, but it's not common where they'll say, yeah, you know what? I was just talking about that last night. Come on over. I mean, yep. that happens, yep. <laughs> but it's pretty rare. Yep. Um, usually it's a long-term nurture play. That's what this is. You're just getting people in your database and you're staying in touch and then you're staying top of mind. You're delivering value. And when the time comes, you're the person to choose. I've had, I've had people in my database. So the, the one this year, the quickest one was I think uh, 35 days called her. They said they were thinking about it, sent them the email, set them up on the solds, kept in contact with them. 35 days later, I listed their house to the extent of another lead that's been in my CRM for 1300 days. So, you know, it, it, you never know where it comes from. And that's why, you know, you have a robust system. And that's, that's another huge thing is like, you know, a lot of people who start off, they don't want to pay for a CRM and understand that, you know, they use an Excel spreadsheet, but it's definitely not scalable. That type of system is not scalable where you eventually need to get to a system that becomes scalable that I don't care how many people I add into, they're all going to be in contact with while I'm sleeping. You know, it's about leverage. Yeah. If you're running a business, you need to know your numbers. That's what it comes down to. And like you said, if, if you need to and work backwards, let's say you want to make $100,000 a year. Great. Awesome. So let's say your commissions are $10,000. So you need to sell 10 homes. Great. Yep. Wonderful. Work backwards. How many from those 10 homes, how many appointments do you need in order to score those 10 listings? Let's exactly. call them all listings. And then, okay, well, how many calls do I need to make to make those 10 or whatever it is, right? So give me some insight in terms of what people can expect. I mean, the numbers that you laid down right off the bat when you're saying, you know, you call for an hour, you contact about 20 people, you get about two contacts. That's fairly accurate, actually. Yep. Um, I I find overall sometimes more sometimes less but it's all around that ballpark yep. uh, what can people expect in terms of you know translating into numbers so out of those so basically um, it again it becomes an evolution you're gonna get on the phone now you got to now up your listing game your listing presentation game your pre-listing package all that kind of stuff and i found that as i started to farm i didn't really care too much about qualifying i really just wanted to meet the person so it was hard for me to say what my, so before that, my listing ratio to, 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 to sign ratio was probably about 60%. So, you know, two, roughly about two in every three listings that I go on, I would get, um, which, which was good for me. Uh, the average is about 25%, right? So uh, one in every four appointments you go on, you get a listing that's pretty good. You want to keep on upping that. Um, so it was, it was important for me to go on an appointment in a farm area than to qualify the appointment and not go on it. So I would go on listing appointments where I wouldn't get the listing because I just wanted to go and meet them or that that's what it happened to be. So my numbers over time started to fade to a certain degree because I was diluting that, that appointment, but you will have to understand how to go to a listing appointment, how to get that paperwork signed. And that unfortunately comes 
before you actually even step to the property. That comes with qualifying that lead well before you even step foot to the property. And then it comes, then what comes into play is what you do before you even get to the property. So when I go to a listing presentation now, before I get to the house, I drop off a box that has my pamphlet, my booklet in it, swag, notepads, uh, towels, mug in a nice little box with their name on it. They get that two days before I show up to their house. So unless you're know, going later that day, do you always book it two days in advance for that reason? I try. Okay. My listing, my listing booklet, uh, actually, my pre-listing booklet has the person's house on it with their name. So I need to get these printed off by the printer before I show up. Ah. So if I can get a day or two, that'd be great. Sometimes it doesn't happen, which it's fine. But for the most part, if I can do that, your work when you get there is much less. People don't understand that because I've already, I've already, I, I'm already credible in that sense. They've gone through the list. They've seen all that stuff. There's some of my flyers in that package. So they understand, wow, this guy is, you know, and it's also about standing out because right. Lauren, how many friggin' agents are in the GTA right now? Like there's everyone down the street. I'm calling houses that I'm talking to agents. So I'm an agent too. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah, man. Like, it's like six, right? 62,000 plus there, right now. There you go. That's just in Treb. We have yeah. 90,000, I think in Ontario. So how can I stand out different from somebody else? What will I be able to do different? And that's really what I'm looking to do. Um, law of reciprocity. When I go to somebody's house, I bring some type of dessert of some sort, little, little, little box of croissants or muffins or cookies, something. Because a law of reciprocity means that they will subconsciously feel, you know, uh, that they have to reciprocate somehow. They will be obligated to reciprocate, whether they con consciously or subconsciously feel it. That's the idea behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point in time, it just becomes, well, how well are you at articulating again, back to what you said, communicating that, you know, there are 60,000 other agents, you know, do you feel, can I prove that I'm the best agent for you? And can I show you that you have confidence in me to get you the most amount of money for your house? Because we all can sell a house. I don't care whether you're the top agent in the GTA or the, you just got your license. We'll all be able to sell a house in this market, roughly to a certain degree. It's now about, well, you know, can I give the person the confidence? Can I make them the most amount of money? Do they feel that the house is best in my hands and anybody else's hands? So you've talked about your process now, and, and I appreciate that. So basically, just to run it and summarize it for people, you're making the call, you're collecting their information, you're staying in contact for whatever period of time that is, okay, by delivering them some, some piece of value, okay, mm -hmm. to them. You're reaching out, you know, once a quarter or season, whatever, with these, uh, you know, giveaways, right? Mm -hmm. And then at that point, at some point when they're ready, they raise their hand. Is that right? And they say, I'm ready now, or hopefully. you are contacting them and, and they say they're ready now. One hopefully. Or the other, right? So yeah, after I got their information, then I'm going to keep in contact with them. Right. So, yeah. But when it comes to the point of whenever they're ready, then, so if you're in contact with them over a two, three year period, at some point there'll be a flag saying they're ready to sell and it's time to get together. Either they reach out to you or you re you're reaching out to them on your regular contact. Okay. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you missed some of those. Yes, absolutely. You're not going to get all of them. It just doesn't happen. Nope. 100%. Okay. And then at that point, you're delivering a pre-listing package with your swag and information. Now in pre-listing packages, you know, different people send different things. Um, in terms of information, some people say, give them this or don't give them this, whatever. It could be testimonies. It can be your marketing plan. It could be commissions. It could be um, the comparative market analysis. It can be all of that or none of that but at least you're preparing something to differentiate yourself from everybody else, right? 100%. You're showing up at the door for the appointment with something, okay? I would caution against anything with peanuts just because people are kind of okay. crazy with peanut allergies out there, so be careful with that. Yep. Um, but in general, you're showing up with something, it creates that law of reciprocity, which is 100% true. I mean, I find that to be the case. When you're coming and giving something of value to someone, they feel like they, they wanna return that somehow. So that's a great way to start it out. Great tip. When you're in the house, how are you presenting? What are you doing? Are you going through, walking through the house and doing the tour? Or are you doing like a full like computer presentation? Or is it all done by the pre-listing? I get this question a lot. And I'm probably the worst person to answer this question. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. I do not have a conventional listing presentation. I struggled with it many years ago, having this box presentation and doing PowerPoints and all this other shit. 
the last four listing presentations I went, I sat, I went to, I sat on the couch, had my legs crossed. I didn't take out one comp and we just talked. Literally, I just talked. Then they said, oh, do you want to go look at the house? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I kind of have an idea. But because I was in a farm area and I was able to tell them everything in the area that sold, they trusted me for that. I didn't pull out one comp out of my thing. And at the end of it, they just signed the papers. So it comes down to understanding the person that understands who I'm selling to. Again, that's the biggest aspect. Am I selling to, am I selling to an engineer? If I'm selling to an engineer, I need to have graphs and, and numbers and let them know exactly percentages. That's a little bit different. If I'm selling to a, an older person who's retiring and they're moving to a condo, they need to be sold as soon as possible. They just want somebody to make sure, you know, they want somebody to comfort them, to let them know, I'll take care of it. Sit back, relax. I'll declutter. I'll clean. Don't worry about Mrs. Smith. It's taken care of. Perfect. That's all they want. So again, it comes down to selling the pen to somebody who doesn't need the pen. So, and I, 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 I don't believe in a box listing presentation. I believe in catering it. And again, I'll bring it even back to the cold calling. It's the skill that allowed me now to go into somebody's house and be able, being able to be a chameleon and think on my feet and move in with the direction that's going to be most comfortable for that person. I'm glad you brought up skill because I wanted to circle back to this. So this is perfect. <laughs> um, it's as if we planned this. So. <laughs> So I want to talk about, you know, common objections that, that you hear, whether on the phone or on person, because this would be fun for people to listen to. I mean, you've, sure. you've had a ton of experience. You've heard it all before. My favorite one is, you know, that we hear all the time without a doubt you hear, I want to, I'll be carried out in a, you know, in a box, box or whatever. Yeah, you know? Exactly. Um, yeah. So what, what do you say to these things? I mean, that's what holds people back is the fear of, I have no idea how to react to these things or what to say. And th there are no magic pills, okay? You're not gonna convert you know, uh, an objection into a listing like that, but there are some fun things to say and, and ways to handle it. I'd love to hear your approach on your most common objections and objection handlers. Um, so yeah, so uh, before we start, there's some, there's some objections and there's some conditions. I yes. cannot, I cannot, I cannot overcome a condition. I can overcome an objection, but not a condition. So if they say they're going in the pine box, well, ma'am, I hope that's not for another hundred years. God bless. Talk to you later. See ya. Um, you know, that's, that's fine. They're not leaving. They don't plan to leave. And when they die, you're going to have to find out who's the state and, and it becomes a huge mess. Anyways, uh, somebody who says, well, where am I going to go? Well, I don't know. Maybe you're going to go to Florida with a girlfriend. Like I get, I, I'll use that <laughs> response and I get a chuckle out of the person. Um, or, you know, I, I want to give you one. So out of, for the pine box thing, I, I had another episode and uh, a great guest who said, you know, I'm going to get out of here in a, in a pine box. They're going to have to drag out my dead body. And he's going to great. When do you think that's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> and that, people usually laugh at that when you say it in jest. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, so, so for stuff like that, I'm not going to, it's more of a, just, I'm doing it for fun for myself so I can right. chuckle, make them chuckle. Um, but objections, you know, uh, I need to, I need to talk to my wife about it. Ch totally understand. How about we do this? Uh, I'm in the area tomorrow around five o'clock. Um, why don't I schedule pension in for tomorrow at five? Speak to your wife. And if it doesn't work out and the uh, time doesn't work for you, give me a call back. But otherwise, I, I'll have you in at five o'clock for tomorrow. So you're gently put, gently push, putting them in a scheduler, holding them accountable to a time and now leaving the ball in their court to say, you call me if you want to cancel. Okay, great. And do you do you call to confirm those appointments, or do you just? I show don't. Up? Nope. I show up. Is that by design or? Yeah, it's by design. I don't. I don't. I don't. If I give them again, why would you want to give them an opportunity to cancel? If you call them and said, "Oh, uh, yeah, I'm coming over to in in three hours," my my first instinct, if I was that person, I'm like, "Oh, fuck, that's right." You know what? Uh, just it's not a good time for me, right? I don't want them. I don't want to open it up to them. But the other side of that is just to play devil's advocate is they're not there because they forgot and they went out to the restaurant or whatever the case may be. They I'd rather, I'd rather have that room. knock and, and do that as opposed to not do anything. So for the most part, if you've qualified them good enough and it's a decent person and you're able to have a good conversation with them on the phone, they should be home. Okay, great. So uh, on to the next one. Give me a few more. Uh, go ahead. You give me an objection. <laughs> <laughs> Go with role sure. play. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, what about the ones where they say, "Yeah, you know, I've I've got a friend in the business. If I ever do anything, I'll use them." I totally understand you have a friend, and and that's amazing. I'm sure a lot of people have friends. Um, you know, if you felt that the house was better in my hands and you're able to make more money by using me, would you give me at least ten minutes of your time to show you that? I don't know. 
No, you're not sure. Well, I'm asking, are you really close with your friend? Yeah, yeah, we went to high school together. Amazing. Would you be able to fire him if he didn't do a good job? Oh no, that wouldn't go over well. There you go. So a lot of people don't want to mix business with, you know, friendship as well as a lot of people don't even want their friends or, you know, family to know what their finances are. Mm, I see where you're taking this. So then, uh, okay, fine. Let's get together. Yeah. So th there you go. So th I, and I totally understand. You know what, Mr. Mr. Cooper, give me 10 minutes of your time. Let me sit down. You have nothing to lose. If anything, I'll give you a couple of tips and tricks to give to your friend who will list your house. Again, if you feel the house is best in my hands and I can get you the most amount of money possible, we can do something. Otherwise, feel free to kick me out of your house. Sound good? Sure. Done. Why would you not? So again, why would you not want to meet with me just to hear a second opinion? Right, exactly. That doesn't, doesn't hurt. Yeah, absolutely. So do you find, just stepping out of this for a second, do you find that people go through your pre-listing information or, uh, or is that kind of half and half? Or Yeah, what, it's what? about half. At the back of my pre-listing pre uh, pre package, there's questionnaires that they fill out and stuff like that. So if I go to a presentation and I see that booklet's open and they filled out those questionnaires about taxes, their keys, all this other stuff, you I know it's the, in the back. I got the listing. I don't exactly. I don't even have to do anything. Perfect. Here is the paperwork, guys. Let's get this signed. We're okay with this price. Done. Uh, other times, it's just to solid. It's just to make them feel comfortable that they are interviewing, meeting with, or going to hire a competent agent. That's all it is. People just are are very skeptical, and they want to make sure they're making the right decision. So right. you know, having somebody who does this, then okay, wow, he does this just to come and meet us. What's he going to do when he has our house now? So he probably, it'd probably be best in his hands than anybody else's. Good point. All right. Here's another one that I hear all the time. Um, we just moved in two years ago, so we're probably not going to go anywhere. Okay. Not a problem. If you did move somewhere, would you be upgrading or downsizing? Uh, I don't know. It won't be for a while. Maybe, maybe going down because this is sort of our, our big house. And it, if we move, it'll be after the kids get out of high school. Oh, perfect. And, and how long is that before they are, they're done high school? Uh, I don't know, four or five years. Awesome. Okay. Well, it would it be okay if I kept in contact with you by email? You're not the right person for me. Right. So uh, it goes back to qualifying and finding somebody. I want to find somebody like my main first objective is to find somebody who wants to buy or sell in the next 30, 60, 90 days. After that, now that person is a nurture. So you're a nurturer. Fair. You're looking four or five years. Fair enough. Not a problem. Take your information, put them into my system. And I'm not, I'm not going to, if I push you too hard enough, I become a sleazy salesperson. Right. And I'm doing it for the sake of trying to sell you a property as opposed to help you. And that's not you're offering something of value, like you can offer when you're saying, uh, you know, if someone like this, I would just be like, oh, that's great. Enjoy the neighborhood. It's a fantastic place. Yada, yada, yada. Listen, if you're curious about what your house is going to be worth, you know, at that time or what homes are selling for and how much money you've made, I'd love to send you that kind of information via an email. And that's a great way to get in there and just send them that, that stay in touch sort of thing so that if and when they ever have any real estate questions or questions about the community because they just moved in, feel free to reach out anytime, you know, awesome. and, and create that kind of relationship, long-term nurture, right? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. And, so, and that, that's a good point. And why I said that sort of long-term thing, because like you said, you have to understand your objectives and who are the people that you're really going after. Yes. Yeah. Because if I push that person who just told me that they're not going to move through the kids finish school and I'm going to push to try to get an appointment and go over to this person's house and try to force them to sell. Well, first of all, that's not who I am. That's not what my makeup is. That's not, the, you know, I, I have integrity to do. I, I'm not going to do something like that to somebody. I'm not here to change somebody's mind. I'm here to prove that I'm the best agent if they are looking to move or sell. Right. You're not going to convince somebody to sell their house who wasn't thinking about selling. You're just there to help people that are. <laughs> yeah. So we're not, we're not back to like eight years ago when it was that high pressure sales that people used to do, or this is not boiler room or, you know, uh, Wolf of Wall Street here. Uh, we're here to find somebody who's interested in our services and you're not to, to, to convince them to sell, like you said, to convince them that you're the best agent for them. Right. And not necessarily convince them, but show them. And, and, and it, all these little things that you're doing is to show how competent and knowledgeable you are.
Absolutely, 100%. So if somebody's thinking now, because we're basically at our time, and I thank you so much again for sharing <laughs> all of this. <laughs> if somebody's thinking about, okay, I like what I hear, I, I understand I need to get business, this sounds like an efficient way to do it. Um, what would you suggest is a good plan of action to start from sort of ground zero, I want to start this, and I want to get to my 100,000 slash, you know, 10 sales a year or one sale a month, let's say a sale a month. Mm -hmm. What would be a good plan of action overview sort of 10,000 foot level day one, two, three, four, give them some steps or step one, two, three, four. So step one is pick the area. Yeah. Pull the numbers for the area. Step two would be start to call those areas. So spend, you know, two hours a day, five days a week, four days a week, three days a week, mark down how many calls you make, mark down how many contacts you made. So how many people you dialed, how many people actually pick up. And out of the people you pick up, how many people you're actually adding to database or you're nurturing or you've gotten their information. That's the number one step. Do that for two, three months. You know, um, you watched Moneyball. You need a big enough sample size to make any decisions. So doing this for a week is not a big enough sample size to say, oh, this is shit. It's not working. All that other stuff. Right. I, I heard an analogy uh, the other day that, you know, my nose is basically an inch away from my mouth. I can have the worst breasts in the world. I would never know but you would know, even though I'm so close to it, I still would not know. So a lot of people are always never uh, not looking back on themselves. It's always the lead that's terrible. It's the person on the phone that's terrible, but it's what, look back at yourself and say, well, maybe I'm just really shitty on the phone. Maybe I don't know what to say. So marking those metrics of how many calls, how many contacts, how many people I'm speaking to, and then, okay, I'm speaking to 10 people, but I'm not getting anybody's information. Well, is it something I'm saying? So the biggest thing during those two, three months, I would, I suggest everybody to do is to record yourself during those phone calls, record yourself. Cause it is the most cringe worthy sounds that you're going to hear ever in, in, in your life. You're going to say, Oh my God, do I sound like that? Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Oh my God, that's terrible. But that's a learning experience. You'll never do it again. You'll learn right. from it. Other, as opposed to just ignoring it and never hearing it. So doing the calls is probably the most important thing. Uh, executing it. Just, just make the calls. You, you know, you don't need to have a dialer. You don't need to have all this information. You don't need to have, just find numbers, go to yellow pages. I don't care. Figure it out, find numbers some way, somehow, and call people. This is a contact sport. The more people you contact, the more people you're going to find interested. And then you can start to fine tune and, and, and almost like an F1 engineer, you can find out to see where you're slow, where, you know, what corners are you slow in? How can you speed that up? Where can I move this number up higher? And that's when you now you can start to understand it. And all has to do with self-reflection, looking back on yourself. Shit, I need to get better on what I'm saying or how I'm saying it. Uh, and that's when maybe, you know, you start to role play with other people. I used to role play all the time, guys from the States mostly. And I'd role play with them just a couple, you know, 10, 15 minutes just to kind of sharpen my skills all the time. So, okay, great. And then uh, you're getting to know your numbers. You're looking back, you're reflecting, you're analyzing, and you're putting them in a system for follow-up because it's important. I think if you're just calling people, you're, you're missing a huge opportunity to develop those relationships in a database. You have to try to get their information, right? I mean, I, I, as soon as I talk to them, there's some people I, I send out letters to them. So as soon as I talk to them, I'll send out letters. This is from my, this is from my calls this morning. So there's some people that don't have emails. The areas that I call are a little bit older people. So I'll mail them out something, but even still, even if you get somebody's email address, might even still just get some blank cards from the dollar store, write down pleasure speaking with you today. Should you need anything? Let me know, put your business card in it and, you know, spend a dollar on a, on a stamp and send it out to them. They'll keep that. That enters their that enters their fortress, right? Because emails don't enter their fortress, but mail actually comes into their house. So they'll open it up, especially if it's addressed to them. You know, you exactly. see something, something that says Lauren Cooper on it written down, you're gonna open it up. You may throw it out, but you're gonna open it up. So um, a lot of this stuff, I, I think the problem with a lot of people is they're looking for a quick, easy thing. And they're they're thinking that there's a new way of doing it. And there's better ways of doing it, but I don't think we need to get away from that old school way. Cause to be honest, I think things are cyclical and I have a feeling we're coming back to that old way. I mean, look at the pandemic. The only people that reached out to me saying, shit, Mike, I can't do an open house. I can't do door knocking. I got a call now. I don't know how to do that. I've had tons of people reach out to me during this pandemic saying, I need to sharpen my skills. And if they would have just sharpened their skills at the beginning, nothing, nothing could have stopped them because this, this transfers over into every single pond that you can think of. 
Absolutely. Now, let's talk about this. How would people get a hold of you if they want you to help them with that? Ah, uh, Facebook. You look at me. Uh, look me up on Facebook, uh, Michael Samra. I'm on Instagram, Michael Samra underscore Realtor. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Getsold.ca is my website. You can reach me through there, uh, as well as I have uh, Prospecting Ninjas on uh, on Instagram and Facebook as well. Uh, group that we uh, basically we basically hold each other accountable. We have a Monday and Friday group, which is for people who like myself who cold call. We get on together for two hours Mondays and Fridays, and we just all call. We have a five minute little uh, little motivational video where somebody says something at the beginning, and then basically you know 10, 15, 20 of us are just calling away chatting away on zoom and uh, posting our numbers and contacts. And uh, so uh, that that's, uh, that's something that uh, if you're free to join or you, you want to keep yourself accountable, that might be a good group to join. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. Fantastic. Thank you again so much. This has been wonderful. Thanks it's great me. when I, I can it. have some friends on the show too. Sometimes you know? <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. I appreciate it. <laughs> we didn't talk sense. about guitars or music. Oh, well, that's because I've got my digital background and you there can't you really see any of the guitars on the wall there, but uh, we'll do that next time. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, brother. <laughs> Take care, brother.